want me to start? Okay, James, take it away. Hello, my name is James Logan. Uh, as Brian mentioned, I'm one of the system admins here at the Northwest Justice Project. Uh, between me and the other gentlemen, we're responsible for pretty much everything Jer uh, NJP needs for its technology purposes. Um, I'm going to just go through a quick rundown on how we got to our current UC system. One more. So we started this whole process with NJP being 17 different offices, uh, which meant we had 17 different phone systems. Uh, in our Seattle location, which is our biggest office, we uh, additionally had a, a call center. So in Seattle, we had Navaya phone system, which included the call center. And in all of our branch offices, we had Toshiba, little wall mount phone systems. Uh, all of our technology was starting to age. The phone system in Seattle was probably close to 15 or 16 years old. It was installed in 1996, finished configuring, configuring probably the end of 96. Um, being it was so old, any time it broke, it was a serious hassle to try and find hardware, support, anything. Uh, additionally, the features we'd purchased in the system had slowly been dying. Uh, we had no more historical reporting for phone calls. Uh, the IVR system was just gone. It stopped working in like 2004. Um, the, it was just super old, super old equipment. Uh, additionally, we had a Polycom video conference system that we used for all of the offices to be able to do video conferencing. The Polycom system was probably close to 10 years old as well. Uh, we had one camera in each office. People would have to gather in our conference rooms. Um, it, just an old legacy system. Our goal was to find a platform, be it hosted or on premise, where we can have all of the modern features that come with current UC systems. Uh, integration with your email systems, the ability to chat with people, uh, be able to do video conferences from anywhere, desks, not just in conference rooms, to be able to keep track of people's presences so you would know when to be able to call somebody or know that they're busy and unable to talk. Uh, having an integrated directory so that you could just type somebody's name to be able to call them rather than having to have a piece of paper or a list somewhere with everybody's phone numbers on them. Um, that was our goal. Part of what got us to that was in 2010, NJP came up with a strategic, a strategic plan. And part of that plan was that we as a organization wanted to be able to act as one statewide law firm. We did not want to be 17 small offices under the name of Northwest Justice Project. We wanted to be able to collaborate together, share cases between offices, and really do that all in real time, not have to just wait for somebody to respond to an email or you know, have difficulty sharing documents because the only method was email. Um, going through this process, you know, we had lots of questions popped up, like, what happens if we go to a UC system? Where is the phone system installed? Uh, if we only have one phone system for the entire organization, how, how do you do redundancy? How do you keep the entire organization from failing if the phone system goes offline or you lose internet somewhere? Uh, speaking of internet, how do you connect 17 offices to one phone system that's all across the internet? Do we go with uh, an MPLS network? Do you use VPN tunnels, um, how do you connect everybody? The, then had the other big questions like how do you train people if you're migrating 200, we're in our case we're about 220 people, but how do you train 220 people on one phone system in 17 different locations? So, so James, you just hit on an acronym there that I know a few people know, but uh, could you explain for a second what an MPLS is? Because that's uh, one sure. of the big considerations people have. and why, why it's even worth considering over VPNs. Um, I couldn't tell you what the definition of MPLS is off the top of my head, but basically an MPLS is a private network that connects all of your network offices together without having to traverse the internet like a VPN connection does. Um, typically they are private internet connections or private network connections you pay your provider for that go from one location to another location. So that data is perfectly secure perfectly private so that it's not snoopable by malicious people on the internet, but it comes with a significant cost increase. 
Uh, and my Google says, MPLS stands for multi-protocol label switching. That help? Yes, thanks. Okay. Um, some of the other questions we come up with, should we hire consultants? Should we try to do this all in-house? Uh, NJP is lucky. We have, me and the other gentlemen are relatively skilled. We've been working in the technology field for a long time as system administrators. So our knowledge level is a little bit higher. Or we've had more time to practice on some of these systems. All right, so once we start getting through the process, we decided we do need a consultant. So we hired a consultant that helped us find solutions, come up with different packages of what we need. We were presented with realistically three choices. Uh, one of our choices was a Cisco system, uh, fully Cisco. They have call centers. They have all the presence feature we wanted. You buy it, you brand it, it's called Cisco. Uh, another alternative we would come up with was Link, uh, Microsoft's PBX that they now sell. Um, with the Microsoft's Link, though, it did not come with a call center. So in order for us to use Link, we would have to find another third party that worked with Microsoft Link, that is the call center. Uh, the solutions we found for that were called Interactive Intelligence and Enghouse Interactive, which previous to last year was called Zcom call center software. Um, there were benefits between the Cisco system versus the Link system. Uh, being a nonprofit, we were able to get the Microsoft licensing at pennies per user versus the typical profit organizations that pay much more money for it. Um, the Cisco solution had some nonprofit discounts, pretty reasonable nonprofit discounts, but their licensing was set up in a method so that for every feature you wanted, you had to buy a new license. So if we wanted to add presence or we wanted to add chat beyond just a basic phone system, it was a new license. If we wanted to add conferencing and video conferencing, that was a new license. Uh, and then additionally to that, in order to run the Cisco phone system, we had to buy Cisco hardware. So it meant buying Cisco servers, Cisco switches, you name it. For them to certify that it, it was Cisco branded everything. Uh, Link, the benefit of Link, it was one license pretty much gets you all. You buy a user license and then you buy a server license. And being discounted in TechSoup really helped. Uh, Enghouse Interactive for the call center software is a it's a virtual software solution that we were able to install on top of our existing virtual infrastructure. Uh, it came very similar to Cisco where you had to buy different licenses for the different features you wanted, but they also had a very nice nonprofit discount. And then comparing them to Interactive Intelligence was a very similar solution, very similar licensing costs. There was no real difference between the two. What ended up making a significant difference for us was the consultant. So the consultant we ended up hiring told us that they were able to do everything. They can install the link software with us. They can install the call center software with us, the Enghouse call center software with us. They would be able to help us configure all of the different features for link and all the different features for Enghouse. And that was a real bonus to us. That meant it really was only one person we'd have to talk to throughout the course of this project to get our phone system integrated, or an integrated setup. So what we ended up buying was Link 2013, that's an enterprise edition, and we bought the Enghouse Interactive Communication Center. Like I mentioned, the consultant we use said they do it all. Going through the process, to answer some of the questions we had about redundancy and single server solutions and not having one thing that could fail on us, we ended up moving all of our infrastructure into two different data centers. We built a data center in Seattle, and then we built another data center on the other side of the state in Spokane. And then the, we were able to then have it set up so that each one of those data centers could work together to handle all of our call center and phone system needs. If at any point one of those data centers had failed, it's not automatic, but the other data center can take over all phone and all video traffic. And then the call center software falls right into play with that. Because of this change, some of the things we had to consider then were how our offices then connect to these data centers where all the new servers and all the software is installed. 
being that we're such a large, large organization, one of the discussions we had with the administration staff was how valuable is being able to have these phone calls and how important is it as an organization to always have an internet connection that never fails. Because that's the caveat, is every single office now connects to the data centers via the internet. So the decision we made was to buy into an MPLS. Uh, we went and bought into a fiber MPLS. There's, there's lots of versions. You can do MPLS networks with T1 lines, with DSL. But because we were moving so much data across this network for the video and the voice and the chat functions of the, calls, of the link system, we decided fiber was our best and most reliable option. Uh, and I say reliable. When we went into the process of getting our network migrated over to this MPLS, one of the things we looked for were SLA, which is service level agreements. Uh, and SLA is basically the provider's promise that we will keep your internet connection running at 99.9% .9 of the time. Uh, for us, that was very important. And there was, a, of a couple of the solutions we looked at, one of the providers wouldn't guarantee that SLA. They'd sell us the service, but they wouldn't say they would keep it up 99.9 whatever percent of the time. And I believe the one we came up with was 99.99 percent of the time. Our service will be up. And some of the benefits of that is if it really goes down for multiple days and it's not our fault, we get a reduction on our bill for that month, which doesn't help the office when we don't have the internet, but it made the accountants happier, so that was worthwhile to us. Uh, with that, though, then we took into consideration, well, we now have these servers in our data centers. What happens if one of the internet connections goes down at the data center? Well, we decided it would be in our benefit to have two internet connections for every data center. So we've set it up so that we have one internet connection dedicated just for the SIP trunks for our call center. And then we have another internet connection dedicated just to internet. But if there's any sort of failure with either of those connections, the other connection can take over all functions. So it can do both the phone calls and the internet. So how, how well has that worked here? Have, have you been able to test it? Has the um, one of the major offices went down? How, how has that worked out practically? Uh, we have tested the failover between the two internet connections. Uh, knock on wood, we actually haven't lost either connection at either data center. We have had scenarios, though, where one of the data centers went offline, and we had a battery failure. I think I don't remember exactly what happened, but basically the data center in Seattle went offline, and the process was really quick. It took us about 15 minutes, and all of our users were migrated over to the Spokane data center. All phone calls started routing over to the other data center automatically, and the entire organization was back online. Uh, the reverse of that is we've had offices lose their internet connections, and We've now been on this new system for a little over a year uh, for the MPLS portion of it. And I think in the course of the year, we've only had about four or five internet outages, four offices located on this MPLS. And the response time through our provider for getting that internet connection back up has been pretty impressive. I think our worst downtime was about three hours. No, that's not true. We actually had a, a power line break or I don't remember how it works. We had an office that actually went offline for a day. Uh, but there was power lines, and you kind of stuck with that. But there was a hardware failure in one location, and within two or three hours, the provider was out there, replaced the hardware, and then the office was back online. Uh, to say it, though, we came up with a backup backup solution in case one of the offices lose their internet connection. So at every office, we've installed a dedicated old-school POTS line, you know, plain old telephone, hooked up to our fax machine so if there's an emergency, people can pick up that phone and dial it. Additionally, with our UC solution, there is a link app that anybody who has a smartphone can install on their cell phone. And so since, as NJP goes, we don't have a policy right now for paying back employees who use their cell phone for business purposes, we don't require that people install the app on their phone. But during one of the outages, it was a small office of four or five people, but two or three people immediately installed the apps on their phone and we're instantly able to make phone calls, answer phone calls, and be back in business with the phone system. Um, yeah, so that's essentially what we ended up with. We have now our statewide phone system. The level and the collaboration has increased exponentially 
There's people who share documents, do video conferences from their desk. I don't think there'd be many people in this organization that would say, I want to go back to the old phone system. I think after the learning curve and after people have experienced the benefits of almost having your cell phone as your communication tool, you know, everything your cell phone can do, our phone system is now capable of doing. People really enjoy the benefits of it. They say they're more effective, and I feel like that's a good thing. Through this process, there is a whole lot of lessons we learned. Um, my boss has a two-page document she wrote up for her TIG grant to go over all just the lessons learned. And I'll keep it a little shorter. I think the lessons of the most value are, are what I'll pass along. One of the biggest, I think, is if you end up picking a consultant that's selling you the entire solution, uh, be wary. I think it is more valuable to hire two or three different consultants that are the masters of the software they sell rather than hiring one consultant who claims to be able to do everything well. Um, hiring a consultant that knows the software they're selling you or the solution they're selling you inside and out makes life infinitely easier when you're in a learning curve and all you're trying to do is get caught up to try and figure out what this new product you've bought is. Pigeonholing your consultant and doing everything all at once doesn't necessarily they'll know everything. Doesn't necessarily mean they'll know everything. Uh, I think there's, I think that's the biggest lesson I learned out of this entire process. Um, additionally, make sure you do your own research. And when I say that, I don't mean learn how the technology works. Learn how the features of the technology. Learn what presence means. Learn how chat could be useful to you. Learn how video conferencing could be useful to you. So when you go through the process of installing and building your UC system or your phone system or your video conferencing system, you can ask your consultants, how can I best use presence or how can I best use video conferencing solutions? If you're hiring somebody to do the work for you, you don't need to know the technical details. But knowing what features you're purchasing and how they really are meant to work with your system is a super valuable tool. Um, give yourself lots of time for mistakes. Uh, one of our best, biggest um, I want to say hurdles was the auto attendance and how we route phone calls to the branch offices and who picks them up. Uh, we went into the process just basically wanting to reproduce what the old office Toshiba phone systems were doing and that wasn't our best practice uh, and it was kind of a mistake for us. We should have let, we should have learned how Link is best suited to route phone calls for branch offices when you want a group of people being able to answer a phone call. <clears throat> it probably would have saved us a lot of time, or I don't say time, it would have saved us a lot of grief having to redesign our auto attendance every time we learned about a new feature or heard that we weren't doing it in the best process. Uh, and then that leads kind of into the, the last one. Don't force your new system to do what your old systems do. Learn how your new systems do what they do the best and then adapt to that and make it so that you use the best features of your new systems. Let those systems guide you in the, 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 the choices and decisions you're going to make to come up with your ultimate solutions. Um, I think that's actually all I've got for presenting what we came up with. That, that's a picture of our server stack in one of our data centers. <laughs> that's what it took to get us to where we are. Yeah, I think that last takeaway in really kind of exploring the system and seeing what is possible and what it does well is extremely important. Don't take what your current system does, try to map that as your business requirements and put together an RFP based on that. You're, you're gonna miss a lot of different opportunities. It, it takes a while to understand what is possible in the unified communication systems, especially if you've been using a kind of a traditional older to, Toshiba system or our Avaya system where it's an entirely different set of technology that you're looking at. So. Um, if there's any questions, please uh, feel free to type those at any time into the question box. Um, also, there's a raise hand feature here, the, this little hand that shows up on your control panel. I can unmute people. Um, they can ask questions that way. I'm going to turn it over to William Guyton here to uh, talk about the process that, that they went through and the choices that they made. 
There we go. As Brian said, my name is uh, William Guyton. I am the, <coughs> excuse me, Director of Information and Technology at LASSO, uh, Legal Aid Services of Oklahoma. And there's my phone number and email. Uh, we are the LSC-funded statewide uh, legal aid provider for the uh, entire state of Oklahoma. Uh, how did I get here? Well, I spent uh, 10 years at Legal Services Alabama. Uh, a little over 10 years. I was hired uh, in early 2005 uh, with a TIG grant, with a TIG. Uh, that that uh, three statewide, uh, three providers in Alabama were merged into one single statewide provider, and I was hired basically to, to do the technology evaluation uh, and to do the technology planning post-merger. That was in February of 2005, and then basically six months later, uh, Hurricane Katrina hit the Gulf Coast, hit New Orleans uh, in, in August of 2005, and we got a, a fairly early TIG uh, devoted to uh, VoIP. Uh, we, we implemented an asterisk system in the state of Alabama specifically to handle the, the volume of out-of-state clients that were, that were moved or, or uh, had to move to Alabama away from New Orleans and other parts of the Gulf that were hit by, hit by Katrina. So I've got some some fairly lengthy experience in VoIP, uh, having put that having helped put that system in back in the fall of 2005. Um, I, I consulted with Lasso for two years. Uh, they they hired a new executive director out of the state of Florida, um, and uh, Michael Figgins basically wanted the same a similar type of set up in, in Oklahoma that we had in Alabama. He, he did an evaluation. He, he was brand new to the program and wanted to get an understanding of what was in the state, what was available, and, 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 how, uh, and how he wanted to deploy uh, technology to help advocate for clients. So I consulted uh, basically as an outsourced CIO for almost two years. And, uh, and, and basically Michael one day, or every six months or so, would say, what's it going to take to bring you to Oklahoma? And, and finally, we, uh, he, he uh, made it attractive, and I, I left Alabama and have been in Oklahoma in my new role for a little bit over a year. So obviously, it's coming in as a, as a, as a new, uh, someone new to the program and, and in charge of technology for the program. I did a, I did a technology review. I did a top-to-bottom technology review. It took about six months. We looked at everything. We looked at hardware. We looked at software, we looked at services, we looked at contracts. Uh, I spent a lot of time in accounting looking at invoices to see how we were spending money. We looked at workflow. And basically, based upon that six-month review, we pretty much decided everything was, was old and busted. Uh, it, it's, the, it's the classic men in black, old and busted. There, there really was nothing in the program uh, from a technology perspective that was worth keeping. Um, also, from a technology perspective, the, the program was really stuck in about 1999. Uh, Windows, Windows Shop, client server, SMB, shared drives, uh, dedicated PBXs in each office, a different internet service provider for each office. Um, and there was really nothing that we, that we could really build upon in terms of going forward and modernizing the uh, modernizing technology in the program. And obviously, you know, hardware was failing, uh, much like James in, 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 uh, in, in the state of Washington, the, the, the phone systems were dying, the, the, the features were failing, services were unreliable, internet was unreliable, and obviously all of that has a very negative impact on mission. Um, so it was basically, we didn't want to keep anything and it was, it was time to rebuild. So, you know, now what? What are, what are our options when we want to rebuild our technology infrastructure in a, in a statewide firm like we are? And you really have three fundamental choices. You can, you, can, you can host your solutions, you can go to a hybrid solution, or you can do an on-premise type solution uh, similar to what James did with, uh, with Link. We had made the decision that we were going to get out of the server business and not invest a lot of time and effort and money in rebuilding the server infrastructure. We were going to allow Microsoft to, to maintain the, the, the servers and the services, and we were, we've started our migration to, to Office 365. We've taken advantage of the nonprofit pricing 
uh, the, you know, the E3 SKU or the E2 SKU that we went under a year ago was free to nonprofits, which is very attractive, obviously. Uh, and we needed to take that money that we would have spent on the back end and do some desktop refreshes and do, and do a lot more technology refreshes on the front side where clients actually, where our staff actually work versus spending money on the back end. So we're, we're in the process of moving to Office 365 and obviously we want a unified communications platform that integrates with Office 365. So we looked, we looked at a, a plethora of providers, uh, 8x8, uh, Shortel, um, Jive, uh, Grand Central. We looked at a bunch of different providers, both on-premise and hosted and hybrid, and decided um, that we were the one that we, we tested and, and thought would fit our needs the best is uh, Dialpad. Uh, Dialpad a year ago, or six months ago, when we first started rolling out or testing Dialpad, was called Switch. It was switch.co, and they've just recently rebranded themselves as Dialpad, and they're at, uh, at dialpad.com. Um, the soft phone, which is one component, is a WebRTC, uses WebRTC as the protocol, and the physical phones are, are SIP phones. Uh, so what I'm going to do uh, in the next five minutes or so is, is give you uh, a demonstration of, of what Dialpad is, uh, both the front end and the back end, and so you can get a better understanding of the way uh, Dialpad works. So on the client side, you, you basically have two choices. You can, you can run Dialpad soft phone, which in, in my instance is a Chrome extension. So if I click here, it's actually going to launch the soft phone. And this is what most of our staff use uh, to communicate is the soft phone. So it, it doesn't require a physical phone. Um, you can load this soft phone. You can load the Chrome extension on any platform that runs Chrome the browser, so it, it works on laptops, it works on desktops, it works on a Mac, it works on a Chromebook, uh, and so it's, it's very flexible in that, in that sense. This is, this is, so this is how I make and receive phone calls, um, is through the soft phone. The, uh, there's two extensions I have loaded. One is the Dialpad soft phone app itself, which is right here. The other extension that I have loaded gives me the ability to, gives me the click to dial uh, capability. So if I find an email that has a phone number embedded in it, I can just click on that particular phone number and it'll, it'll, it'll make the call with Dialpad, which I clicked on it there and you can see it coming up in the dialer. So that's, that's what that second extension does. The, uh, the left-hand column over here, this is, this is my communications history by, by the person that I've talked with. Uh, so if you click on that person, it focuses on Holly. This is one of the managing attorneys in our Norman office. You can see when I've talked to Holly and for how long, on what dates. Um, instant messaging is built into the platform. So if I wanted to text Holly, I just come down here to the bottom where it says new message and I can, I can actually text her because I have, I'm focused on her. The blue dot over here is that presence uh, feature that, that James was talking about. If, if there's a blue dot on the person, they're, they're a member of Dialpad. Um, if you mouse over the blue dot, you can tell whether she's actually online or offline. Uh, Dylan is currently offline, but he is in Dialpad. If, she, if Holly was on the phone, this would turn red and have a little phone icon in it. So I'd know, well, there's no sense in calling Holly because she's on the phone. I'll just text her instead. With Holly highlighted on the right-hand side, you can see some, some details about Holly, her, her dial pad phone number, her email address, the last time I have a, a conversation with her. If I had an email stream with her, uh, you would see it here. This is, uh, this is one of our staff in the Tulsa office, and these are the last three emails with that particular person at that particular number. And again, these are all hyperlinks because this is a Chrome extension, so you can, you can click on an email and it'll, it will actually go to that email. Uh, so here's the email. Uh, related to that. And if Margaret had a, a LinkedIn profile and I wanted to connect to it, I could actually have her LinkedIn profile right here. Another feature that was uh, that, that staff really, really uh, enjoy is the fact that if you, if you add a client contact over here and the only, uh, and you have their mobile number in here as part of a client contact, uh, Dialpad will also send an SMS text uh, as well as an IM. 
So if you wanted, we have a, a, lar a large number of clients that the primary way we communicate with them is via SMS. And so this is a very easy uh, way to, con uh, to communicate with clients that primarily contact us or, or talk to us or staff uh, using uh, SMS. It's, so it's SMS and IM is integrated into the product. All right, let's see. The, um, the icons at the top, the, I mentioned earlier that Dialpad, the app, is integrated with Office 365. And as James said earlier, uh, because all of our staff are in Office 365, the, uh, the, when you search by name or number, you'll actually be able to find those, those staff members. So I put in the first three initials, uh, the first three letters of someone's first name, I get a listing of all of the, the contacts or, or people that I've talked to in the uh, directory but it's also a staff directory. So Michael Figgins is the executive director. He, he's all, uh, this is his dial pad profile. I can dial him just by, I can call him just by clicking on the, on the icon of the receiver. If I wanted to text him, I'd just click on him. It would, it would focus on him and I could text him here. And because this is a Chrome extension, this is an HTML uh, interface right here. So I can drop and drag photographs. I can drop and drag URLs. Uh, it, and it's it, you know all of that data gets trans uh, gets pushed around via dialpad. So you've got some images embedded. Um, this is actually a to-do list in our Norman office hanging off the old PBX. Um, and by the same token, voicemails are also in line. Uh, so if you want to see, uh, let's see who's left me a voicemail. Let's find out. Uh, Margaret, uh, Dylan. I can't find a voicemail. Well, that makes a good point. So I come up to inbox, which is right here. I can actually look at all my voicemails uh, collectively over time. So KnowledgeNet left me a voicemail. If I click on that, it focuses on them, and you can see the voicemail online. And it's played as a wave file. So if I hit play, if I hit play here, I can listen to it over my my speakers or my headset. If I wanted to download that voicemail, maybe I want to throw it into the case management system rather than transcribe it. I can actually download it as an MP3 and and upload it to to the case management system. But that's a that's a good example of what the uh, what voicemail looks like inside a dial pad. So this this is that's a really brief overview of of the client portion of dial pad, the, the soft phone portion. Um, there's also a back-end uh, piece that allows you to manage uh, your, your Dialpad subscription. And it's, it's, a web, it's a website. So if you go to dialpad.com and log in with your credentials, you'll get uh, a page that looks like this. And uh, every user has a Your Settings page and an Analytics page. Because I'm the administrator of this Dialpad instance, I also have the company departments and billing portions of the web page. So your settings, uh, just like any modern, uh, just like any phone system you would think of, your, your numbers, the phone number that of the, off, the, the 800 number of the office I'm associated with, uh, I, can, I can change my caller ID on the fly, I, time zone doesn't make, uh, you know, obviously I'm in the central time zone. Voicemail, you, you, you record your own greeting or take a default. You can have multiple greetings that you flip between an in-office in, in message, out-of-office message. Um, I also have turned on send me an email when I receive a voicemail. I can actually play the voicemail in, in a browser or on the smartphone. Um, your devices section, I have Dialpad loaded on multiple devices. So all these devices ring when someone calls me. So the desktop at the office, the desktop at the house, this was probably a test desktop that I was putting Dialpad on and I can deselect it here. Um, my my desk <clears throat> excuse me my desk phone you have a if you have folks that need a physical phone or want a physical phone then you can either purchase a, a SIP phone through Dialpad or or purchase any SIP compliant phone and provision it through Dialpad. Um, let's see. There's there's the number forwarding to my cell phone, which is right there. If you have uh, there's an exec, executive assistant section that allows you to to add people as your assistant, so when, when someone calls you, it's going to ring multiple phones as an assistant, and you can also be an assistant for someone else. That's those settings there. And then the last section is for E911, your physical address for E911 purposes. Um, 
standard end users also have the analytics, which is what you would think it would be. It shows you your calls, your texts, your IMs, your voicemails uh, by day. Uh, this is for the entire office since I'm an admin. Shows you a breakdown of your calling habits, mostly inbound calls, mostly outbound calls. Shows a breakdown of desk phones versus versus uh, soft phones. So we're at about just just under 50% desk phones, and almost 20 26% of the folks that use DialPad are using the soft phone. And you've got a, a very small number of mobile VoIP users, but the the uh, the app. Uh, you can download the app uh, on your cell phone, whether it's an Android or an Apple device, and you get the same functionality you do with the, uh, the cell phone or a physical phone. And then your call details, who's called, how many calls, minutes, missed, that kind of thing. So that gives you your analytics. From an admin perspective, um, you've got these company departments and billing links. Uh, the company, obviously, is where you're going you're gonna to add new users to, to your to Dialpad. And we currently have 58 people using Dialpad because we have three offices on it now, uh, and we'll, we'll be adding more this year as we deploy to more, more and more offices. But the um, so you can add team members. You can buy a physical desk phone associated with somebody. That's actually going to take me there. I don't want to go there. There's the desk phone. It's a OB High. Let's go back one. So the team is pretty straightforward. You associate an email with, with a name, a name with a number, and, uh, and you use your 365 credentials to log in. So it associates with 365. Main line, that's the main line for this particular office. We assign operators. So these are, the, these are the support staff that are on a soft phone or a physical phone. So when someone dials in to via the 800 number or the main number, these are the two administrative assistants that their phone's going to ring. Um, call handling. Um, we have an IVR set up for the Oklahoma City office. So you get the attendant uh, and she says, you know, please press one for dial my name, press two for the uh, Spanish department. So these are two of our Spanish speaking staff. Uh, the third option goes to a senior hotline and the fourth option is online intake or phone based intake. And then the fifth option is to, to, to ring somebody in that operator group. But you can mix and match between operator mode and system greeting mode and then this is all manageable just by adding different breaking people up or breaking roles up into different departments. All right, Business hours, you can define your business hours which we've done here. Um, if you call before we're open or after we're closed uh, you'll be asked, you'll have the option to leave a voicemail. Um, we've recorded that closed voicemail greeting here and so it, it basically says, you know, we're closed. These are our normal working hours. If you want, to, if you'd like to leave a voicemail, uh, we'll return the call. And those voicemails are fielded. Those voicemails go to the members of the operator, and it's their responsibility to either send that voicemail on to, to a staff attorney or to or to or to make the return call. So we've well, got we've three. We've got three or four quick questions here. Yeah. First one is on Dialpad. What about call routing and call center features? It, it, it doesn't have any call center features as yet. Um, the, the call routing, if you're, if you're doing an IVR, is really done by this particular setup, uh, either to a department or to an individual. Um, we, we do have departments that are voicemail only. So if we go to the department section and go to our immigration department, it, it's a voicemail only department. There's there's two people that, that work in our immigration group and it's if you go down to call handling you can see that we've we've told it go directly to voicemail. And that and the person that's in charge of that department will, will gets notified via email that there's a voicemail pending within that department and they, they listen to it and respond to it respond to it appropriately. Okay. Um, so uh, auto attendance, cues, reporting, and supervisor monitoring. It sounds like some of those are more call center features, but some of those it sounds like it does support. They are. They are. Um, the, the call monitoring feature is, it, there's not a live call monitoring feature. There is a, where is it? I'll have to figure out where it is. One of the, one of the options, let me go back to the dial pad option here. You don't see it here, but there's a you have a call recording on demand button. If we had it enabled, it would show up right here to allow you to record a call. Mm -hmm. um, 
we're still going through the, the process and procedure part in terms of what training we're going to do and what policies we're going to put in place to allow all staff to do call recording. And we may do it as a as we may do it in a smaller subset of users initially and get some feedback. But if you looked on the back side and they where do we have call recording set up? I'd have to find it, but there's a there's a switch that allows you to enable or disable call recording on demand. And currently we have it disabled until we get the, the policies and procedures in place. Um, so this is a little more on the change management side. Um, as a technology professional, these capabilities and features are exciting. Um, how do you get non-tech staff and users to utilize the system? Um, and how would you rate the adoption of the system? Well, the, the real power of, of Dialpad comes from utilizing the software. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's the first thing, that's the first takeaway. Um, I use the soft phone, it, 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 my workflow, generally if I'm on the phone, I need to be in front of a computer. So I've got my headset on like I do now and my hands are free and I can type. Uh, it, it really comes down to, uh, to, to what, to giving you know, staff the tools that they need in order to do their best job. Um, the folks that just simply don't want to run a soft phone, they simply don't want to have a headset or, or something in their ear, then you give them the physical phone option. And they interface with the system just like any other traditional PBX. They don't, they don't get any of the, they get a few of the, the advantages of the soft phone. I mean, the call history and, and that kind of stuff is, is embedded into the software and the, in the physical phone, but they really don't get to take advantage of uh, of all of everything that the soft phone offers us, I mean, w one of the the we've got a tremendous number of staff now that are being embedded in third-party organizations. So we we needed a system that integrated that tightly integrated with Office 365 um, and allowed for uh, basically our staff to advocate for clients anywhere they have an internet connection. So you know the. You don't have to. If you're in a DV shelter, you're in a hospital, you're you're um, you're doing uh, social work. You're outside of your physical office space where a de physical desk phone would normally be. You you don't have that limitation anymore. You're not chasing voicemails. You're not chasing calls, because when my phone rings, again, three computers ring, my my smartphone rings, um, and I get to decide whether if I want to take that call, uh, and on what device I want to take it on. So if I want to answer that call on my on my on my cell phone, I answer it on my cell phone. If I want to answer it with a headset on at a computer somewhere where I'm sitting, that's what I do. Um, as soon as you know, I can load the the Chrome extension and log into the dial pad, and I have all of this call history as if I were sitting in front of this computer today. So the flexibility and power that it gives us to do that away from a traditional office setting is one of the things we really like about. It. So long story short, we're not forcing end users to, to run only the soft phone. We're simply encouraging them that depending on the way they work, they can, and we have some folks that, that, that do both. We have some staff that have a physical phone and use a soft phone. Because uh, one, one of the interesting takeaways is, you know, if you're on a soft phone, someone walks into your office and normally you have your headset on whether you're on a call or not. They don't know if you're on a call or not. So you'll have someone tap you on the shoulder and say, are you on a phone call? And you'll have to say, no, I'm not on a phone call. So it's just one of those social things that's, that's kind of interesting. You know, if you have a physical handset in your, in your hands, then most people will stand there and wait till you get done talking and hang up the call. Um, so, that, so we're not forcing, we're, we're allowing staff to choose which, which method they like, and a lot of staff choose both. The, the physical desk phone is nice if it's ringing and you just have to walk into a room and pick it up versus putting on a headset and logging in. Uh, but the, the soft phone gives you all, those, all of those advantages uh, that, I'm, that I'm showing you right now. Okay, and just to let people know, I, I did get a question over the uh, call center stuff, um, which we'll go back to James Logan uh, to in a few minutes here after uh, William gets through. So I do have that queued up as a question that we're getting to a little bit later. There was also a request for the slides. Um, I will put links to both of the presentations in the chat and they will also be available um, as links in, for the YouTube video and the following blog posts that are available in the next day or two. Cool. 
So this is the, so we've looked at the mainline features. Uh, when you click on desk phones, this is where you, you basically assign a physical phone, which is this OB number, to, a, to an end user. Um, if, you have, if you have common room phones or you don't want to, you want to deploy a phone somewhere in a conference room and not associate it with an individual user, you can, you can drop them into a room phone. Um, our two front desk phones, since, since there's so many people out of the front, uh, they're not assigned to an individual user. They're just generic desk phones at the front desk. We also have uh, a Polycom sound station up in the executive director's office for conference calls, and we'll be deploying these as well. This, is, this shows you that SIP configuration feature that, that you can configure any SIP phone uh, to integrate with Dialpad. Um, if you, one of the nice things about ordering a phone uh, from Dialpad is they'll drop ship the phone. Uh, it's pre-configured. You can drop, we're 17, 18 offices in the state. It's a fairly large state. I don't have to have it shipped here, pre, you know, configure it myself, and then ship it back to the office. We actually drop ship phones directly to the end user. And they literally plug it in and put in a pin, and it reboots and associates them and their number with that particular physical phone. Uh, so that's one of the nice features is, is we can drop ship a phone to an individual end user or to an office. All right, company settings, uh, there you go. So there's, there's where they moved the call recording to. So that's one of the company-wide settings is allow team members to record their calls. Right now we're not. Uh, that's the transfer calls and that's international transfers. Here's some of the executive assistant features going on. When someone goes on vacation, we, wanna, we want someone else covering their calls. Um, this is how you port numbers uh, from, a, from another provider, and we've done a lot of that uh, in the last uh, four months. And then the E911. E from a dial pad perspective, when we add additional offices, they're considered departments of the main office. So the company in this case is the, the Oklahoma City Law Office and the Administrative Office, and every office that we add after that is considered a department. Uh, from Dialpad's perspective. So the Norman office, which is the second office we put on Dialpad, is, is, a, is a department. And you get those same uh, options at a department level that you had at a company level in terms of operators and call handling and business hours. Analytics we've looked at, uh, billing we can look at. The, um, if you were to look at Dialpad uh, right now, I think there uh, actually, I'm logged in. I think they're asking $15 a seat uh, for the standard SKU. Uh, yeah, there's pricing. So they have two SKUs. There's a there's a, a small business SKU or a standard SKU, which is $15 a month. There's an enterprise SKU, which is twice that. Um, we're in the standard SKU at the moment, uh, but we did we were able to negotiate a nonprofit discount. Um, and we're currently paying ten dollars per user per month. Um, it, there's also no contract, so we're not we're not signing a one-year, three-year contract with somebody. Right now, we're going month to month, um, so we don't have a big capital expenditure, uh, and we also aren't contractually obligated to stay with Alpad if if six months from now we're unhappy or or something better comes along. Um, and you can see the feature set that they support with standard and then the additional features that get included if you move up to, uh, move up to enterprise. All right, so that's, that's basically what the billing is going to look like. So you've got, you've got 58 uh, team members, 58 staff at, at $10 a month. Um, We've got a couple of dedicated local lines that we that, that are five dollars a month that generates a new number. You, you decide which area code you want to use, and it generates a it generates a phone number. Uh, toll free, uh, fifteen dollars a month for a room for a room phone not associated with an end user. They do have uh, fax, uh, being able to fax from the dial pad interface. Um, this is a nice feature, um, but. It's, it's not as robust as we'd like in terms of features. Um, it shows up as another option. Uh, it shows up right here as a fax. Um, but when I talked to Dialpad, they said, well, we're, just, we're really just reselling HelloFax. 
I said, oh, okay, well, I'll just, I'll just start using HelloFax. So we're migrating the physical fax uh, lines in each office to, to HelloFax. So that's, that's fax to email. Uh, so that's, that's why this number is so low. We've actually have significantly more folks using HelloFax for, for, uh, for digital faxing. So that's the back end, analytics, and, oh, hold on, let's go back to here. All right, so lessons learned. Let me get my frog back up. Here we go. So we, um, you know, the first lesson is test. You know, you, you need to do a, a tremendous amount of testing. We, we tested with a lot of vendors. Uh, we, had, we had vendors like uh, Jive, and 8x8 that were more than willing to drop ship us a couple of SIP phones, let us test the back end, let us provision phones, let us do some calling. Um, and anybody that's unwilling to, to send you a phone to test or multiple phones to test is, is probably not someone you want to spend your time with. We tested with staff. Um, we actually put a, a, a team together, a cross-functional team together in the Oklahoma City office, administrative assistants, paralegals, social workers, uh, attorneys, and 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 basically gave them dial pad, gave them a physical phone, gave them a soft phone, and said, here, would you please you know, run this for a week and give us some feedback, both, both good and bad. So we took a lot of user feedback and, and, and adjusted accordingly. They liked this feature. They didn't like this feature. They wish this behaved, behaved differently. Um, and, we, and we fed that back to dial pad in terms of, you know, hey, uh, you know, people want to be able to SMS to clients. Well, then they would tell us, well, that feature is going to be deployed in 30 days. And, and generally that was true. Um, another, another important takeaway, obviously, is, is you're not going to succeed with all staff uh, based on consistent call quality versus copper or PR, PRI services. I mean, VoIP is not copper and it's not a traditional PRI type service. So you have to, you have to manage expectations versus reality. Um, and you're just not going to make everybody in the firm happy, especially if you're a large, if you're a large property law firm. Uh, so we've got some folks that are ecstatic about it. We've got some folks that are like, eh, don't really care. And we've got some folks that, that, that we're, we're working with to help explain just occasionally the idiosyncrasies in, in call quality that you have. And that's a lot like cell phones 10 years ago. You know, if you have a bad call, hang up and, and call again. And generally, it's been our experience that that's, that's the best way to approach it. Um, James talked earlier about disaster recovery and, and, uh, and redundancy. And you are going to need to monitor. Um, we're, we're pushing all of this data and voice over our, uh, our upgraded NPLS connections. And you need to be able to monitor those circuits. And you need to have a disaster recovery plan. And much like James said earlier, our disaster recovery plan, at least from a voice perspective, is encouraging uh, staff to install and utilize the app on their smartphone. Uh, if we have an internet outage or a power outage in Oklahoma City or in Tulsa or anywhere else in the state, uh, they're usually pretty good at, 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 at you know, pulling their cell phone out of their pocket and, and being able to make calls. The, the app installed on your cell phone allows you to hide your personal cell phone number. So when you return a call or take a call, you can tell Dialpad, hey, use my personal number or use my business number. Use that once or use that always for this particular contact. So you're not exposing your private cell phone number to a client. Um, uh, you don't have to do that. The, the app allows you to choose your caller ID on a per call basis or to set it permanently based on a contact. So that's our disaster recovery plan from a voice perspective is making sure that, that, that staff know that that's an option. And we've used it, we've used it in a couple of instances. Any further questions? Nope, we're caught up in the questions and I put in the chat uh, links to both um, William's presentation and to James's. So please feel free to type in any other questions or raise your hand if you want us to unmute you and ask a, a question via voice. Um, James, do you want to talk for a little bit more about the our choices on the call center, um, things like uh, features or options that we have now that we didn't have with our old dying system, that type of stuff? 
Um, sure. I mean, I hate to say it, the features we have now are all pretty basic. Uh, the the sad part of our old phone system was the simple things like losing historical reporting. Uh, we actually lost live reporting right before we switched as well, or live tracking, I should say. Uh, with the new system, I think one of the best features is being able to manipulate call traffic and messaging and call handling in real time. Uh, an example would be the way our call center is set up, we have a main phone number you dial into, and then there's a series of cues that sit, based, sit below that based on your choices. You press 1 for Spanish, you press 2 for English, so you have these, these hierarchies. Well, if it works out that we do not have any Spanish-speaking advocates or call center folk that day, we can just turn that cue off. And we can set it so that cue gives an independent message. So we could say something simple like, we're sorry there's no Spanish speakers available today. Would you like to speak to an English person? Or you can hang up and call back tomorrow. Uh, we, and we can do that in real time while the call center's going, even during hotline hours. And we can do it from anywhere. We do not need to be climbing into our phone closet anymore and sitting in front of what would be a super antiquated CRT with a massive keyboard in front of it. Uh, our call center, we now have a call center administrators that have very little technical knowledge who manage the system. So they're the one who changes the, the mode, set it to close, set it to open, all in real time. And the learning curve for them was really pretty low. Uh, one of the next features we're working on building right now is being able to automate callbacks. Um, and when I say that, it's not for a client who's called in who wants a virtual hold, where they want to be in hold for a queue, but they don't want to stay on their phone. We have that feature, and that was kind of a standard feature. The feature we're trying to add now is where you can go to a website as one of the advocates or one of the people answering the phone and fill out a form, and it'll schedule a call whenever you want to schedule that call. Uh, so the, the goal for that is to integrate it into our online intake. So we would like to someday down the road get a client through the end of our online intake and then have them fill out this form where they put in their name, their information, their phone number, and we have all this previous information that's already in our case management system, and then they just click what time do they want to call, enter. And then the system automatically will cue them for a call on that day at whatever time they picked. And then they fall into next in line and get their phone call as if they had called in. I think that's okay, one of so the best features we've gone for. So two questions. Um, does everybody who is on your call center need to be located in the same office? No, sir. We can have people located anywhere. I want to say anywhere in the world, but realistically, the Internet is the thing. So anywhere you can get a ser decent Internet connection, you can be part of the call center. Okay. And how robust are your MPLS connection speeds? Which um, I think this is a question both of you guys can answer. James, first. So ours are kind of varying. Um, to give you the quick rundown, in the data centers we have 200 megabits per second connections uh, because all of the traffic from all of the branch offices routes through them. So at no point did we want to bottle, bottleneck a phone call because I have 16 offices downloading, YouTube, watching a YouTube video or something. So the aggregate of my call centers is more than all of my other offices added up. But so in a small office, we have 10 megabytes. Uh, to a medium-sized office, we have 25 to 30. In the Seattle office, we have 100. And then, like I said, the data centers have 200 each. And we're... we're we're backhauling um, all the data as we deploy MPLS statewide into Oklahoma City. So we've got 100 megabits in Oklahoma City, and Norman, which is an office of a dozen or so staff, is currently at 5 megabits. So we backhaul we backhaul Norman uh, to Oklahoma City, and then and and out to the internet. So we've got one firewall to maintain in Oklahoma City. Uh, for Norman, and as we deploy uh, statewide, we, we will probably add some redundancy in our Tulsa office. So if Oklahoma City goes offline, we'll have another route out to the internet. Uh, but the, the goal is to interconnect all of these offices uh, in a fully meshed MPLS uh, wide area network 
and and backhaul internet and and voice uh, to the co closest point of presence, whether it be Tulsa or Oklahoma City. I guess I should add we're doing the exact same thing. Uh, all of our data goes through the data centers, except for Seattle, where we have 100 people. We have two connections in Seattle still, one being the MPLS, one being a dedicated internet. So does Dialpad have any conference call line options? Um, yes. The, the standard, the, uh, I mean, Dialpad as it sits today will allow uh, three people on a call simultaneously. If you need to add a fourth person, then you would use their other product, which is Uber Conference. And, and so if, if I need to do a conference call that's, that's greater than three people, um, I, we, just, we just go to my Uber page. And, and they, they can either call in with their Dialpad account or they can just call in with a physical phone. Um, Uber Conference is the, is the company that, that, or the product that they offered a year before Dialpad came out. So Uber Conference is three years old and Dialpad is now a little over two years old. Um, and I was going to mention uh, one of the things that we've done uh, in Oklahoma is as a nonprofit, we've actually been able to, to jump on the, uh, the the MPLS network that the state actually uh, inter uses to interconnect the courthouses and the universities and the tech schools and the libraries. So we're we're actually on one net at a at a at a reduced rate. Um, this is cheaper than we could have got it gotten MPLS from any of the for-profit companies, the AT&Ts, the world, uh, as we were able to negotiate and and jump on the the what is basically the state wide area network. So how, how did you go about getting on to, on, onto that? Because we've done a little bit of that with other nonprofits that I've worked with um, in different states. But it, it's been a challenge occasionally to get onto those kind of anchor network, not giant state contracts. Yeah, it, it's, I mean, it, it's, it's really about relationships. Um, <laughs> you know, it, we, we had... Um, we had a couple of we had a board member that uh, that knew somebody that knew somebody and basically opened the door, and we just went to to one net and said, you know, we're we're a state board organization, um, we're 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 legal aid, you know, would you consider us, you know, would you consider uh, allowing us to buy services from one net? And and it it took some took a couple of meetings and and basically uh, they said sure, they said we'd love to have you on. Um, because one of the one of the things that's that's difficult as a statewide provider is you're you're you're, you're they're starting to diversify their user base a bit or their customer base in a bit because they really need real dollars. I mean, a lot of the money that they see is just moved from account to account within the state, um, and it's nice to have some real paying customers that are that are not a state agency. Um, so they've, they've taken a couple of fairly large federal grants to help build out their MPLS infrastructure. Um, and I and I think the feds are starting to encourage a little bit of diversity of, of customers on a lot of these uh, statewide wide area network efforts. Uh, any other uh, any other questions at this point? Generally from the audience. Um, I guess I'd like to uh, give it to each of you for um, one last thing that, that you think if people are going to pull one thing away from this, they're going to um, start on this process. Um, what, what is the best starting point? Is it that um, evaluation of where your, where your network really is? Is it getting out there and exploring what's possible? What, what's the first step for people that really have a need here and this looks very overwhelming to them. You go in first James or am I? Uh, go for it. I'm still thinking. Okay. Well I mean the 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 beauty of of of, of dialpad and dialpad type hosted telephony services is you don't have a huge capital expenditure. You're you're not making a thirty thousand or fifty thousand dollar per office expenditure um, that you can't get out of. 
Um, Dialpad, like I said, is month to month. Um, you know, it's it's like Netflix. It's like it's like any other subscription service because it is a subscription. Um, so dipping your toe into a soft phone type hosted solution like Dialpad is is easy. Um, they'll they'll sign you up and you can run it uh, for 30 days with an unlimited number of users, uh, which really allows you to deploy it and test it within your organizations. Um, you know, the, the harder thing, obviously, is, is managing expectations, in which I mentioned in my, you know, lessons learned, is you're, you're going to have to manage some end users' expectations, especially folks that have maybe been with the, the firm for, for 20 or 30 or 40 years and, and have always had a physical desk phone and have always had a piece of copper or a, or, or a digital PRI hanging off that voice conversation. Um, so there, there's, a, there's a bit of a there's a bit of an old school, new school type of mentality. Um, a lot of the a lot of the staff we deal with that are coming out of law school have no problem sticking an earbud in their ear and plugging it into their laptop and making a phone call because that's that's the Skype type of generation that that has done that and is used to doing that and is comfortable with it. So there's there's some just some managing expectations type of thing that is really more of a challenge than the tech, than than the actual technology itself. Um, I think very similar to what William said, I feel like regardless what direction you ever want to choose, if you think you can afford on-premise, you can't afford it, you want to go to hosted because the capital is not there, I feel like one thing I've learned through technology across many, many years of it now is don't ever be afraid to ask any of the questions, period. There, there are, and I give kudos to Brian, he's building and has built a huge network of people that have experience across so many different pieces of these technology. Uh, so ask questions. Like, there's never a shortage of answers to be had. I mean, and it sounds simple, but I, I guess one of my lessons learned is people don't understand really what any of these features mean. They have no technology, technological knowledge. And they just don't understand what something like presence can be, but they're afraid to ask. So one of the easiest ways we were able to adopt our phone system was we picked our pilot group based on the most untechnologically friendly people we could find. And like William said, some of those older, old school mentality where I have to have a phone. And so we got those guys in our pilot group. And as soon as they started learning the technology and kind of getting excited about it, because they're like, oh, I can chat somebody. This is, this is pretty simple. That was our selling point. That's how we got it going. But we got over the hurdle of it by getting them to ask us questions. And so whatever direction, whatever decision, there's so many solutions, just ask your questions constantly. Easiest way to learn. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you both. Thank you guys all for attending. Thanks for the great questions also. Take care. Thanks.